This is Marianne Martindale from the Alliance for Better Utah, and welcome to the Better Utah Beat. This past week, Interior Secretary Ken Salazar made a stop in Utah. During his visit, he signed off on a plan that will allow for over 3,600 new natural gas wells in eastern Utah and brings with it the possibility of several thousand jobs over the course of the project. This particular announcement was unique as the project was agreed to by not only the petroleum industries that stand to profit from the wells, but also by local government and conservation groups, including the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance. This type of collaborative negotiation and compromise, a word we seldom see used in this type of discussion, is an example of how land issues in Utah should be handled. The agreement and the manner in which it was approached are in sharp contrast to the bills passed by the Utah legislature this past session, which demand that the United States government turn over to the state all of the public land within the boundaries of Utah. These bills passed easily with strong Republican support, despite the legislature's own attorney, John Fellows, warning publicly that the bills are unconstitutional and highly likely to result in a years-long court battle costing the taxpayers millions of dollars. The truth is, no state in the country can force the United States to turn over land. Just ask the southern states how well it worked for them during the Civil War. Far-right legislators such as Ken Ivory and Mike Noel have been trying for years to convince us that if Utah were able to forcibly take over national parks and other public lands, all of our economic woes would come to an end. Unfortunately, that plan has some significant flaws in it, such as the simple fact that national parks require hundreds of millions of dollars every year to maintain. Utah's annual budget doesn't even come close to matching the revenue required to take on such a daunting task. Each legislative session, we see the same budget discussions over and over about the possibility of having to close state parks. If we can't afford to maintain our existing state parks, how can we possibly hope to maintain the national parks we're planning to occupy? The only possible way for Utah to manage these lands would be to sell them off to big oil companies like Chevron or BP. We have yet to see an in-depth study or findings to support the rhetoric associated with this sagebrush rebellion revival. So while it's easy to stand up and demand that Utah be given more of the people's land, Several unanswered questions remain, such as how this unconstitutional task could even be accomplished. Neither Representatives Ivory, Noel, Herod, or Sumption were ever able to present any form of plan showing how even if Utah were somehow able to take control of United States land, they could possibly turn it into a profit without immediately selling it off entirely. Expanded drilling and mining in Utah is inevitable. But the responsible way to handle the issue, like everything else, is through negotiation and moderation. No one wants to see an oil well on top of Delicate Arch, but there are other places that may be acceptable. We congratulate Secretary Salazar for bringing together the oil interests, local communities, and the wilderness protection groups, and showing us how it really can and should work. We'll obviously discuss this more as the plan unfolds, with $3 million already set aside for the court battle This is a fight that will be around for quite a while. In other news, as you will no doubt recall, former Representatives Carl Wimmer and Stephen Sandstrom, two of the founding members of the Patrick Henry Caucus, both suffered resounding convention defeats in their bids for Congress. Well, it seems that neither will be disappearing from local politics, as they have each caused some commotion this week. First, Carl Wimmer took to Twitter to reaffirm his endorsement of the Family Research Council. On the same day, the Family Research Council, while discussing their narrow views on adoption, made the categorically incorrect statement that America has absolutely no excess children in need of adoption. Not surprisingly, this was not well received, and they were castigated in the media for making such a blatantly false statement. Not one to be daunted by facts and figures, Carl Wimmer repeated the FRC's claims and tried to defend his position when pressed. If Mr. Wimmer has any future plans to run for office, we can only hope that he will become a bit more educated about the issues of the organizations from which he seeks endorsements and support. As for Stephen Sandstrom, he made some waves this week by announcing he had changed his opinion on immigration. Sandstrom, of course, gained fame during the 2011 legislative session when he championed the Arizona-style enforcement-only bills designed to seek out and target undocumented workers in Utah. 
But now Sandstrom says that he changed his position after speaking with a 19-year-old Mexican woman who has been living in Utah undocumented since age three. While this is a really nice story, and we applaud Mr. Sandstrom for finally arriving at the understanding that an enforcement-only approach is inhuman, it is hard not to be a bit cynical about his sudden change of heart and to question what's really behind the story. Immigration was the hot topic last year at the legislature, and Sandstrom received hundreds upon hundreds of phone calls, emails, letters, and personal visits from Utahns who were begging him not to push his bills. What was so compelling about this one woman's story that only now he has his life-changing experience? And with him no longer serving in the legislature, is it just another case of too little, too late, since his enforcement-only legislation is already in effect and being challenged in court? With both Mr. Wimmer and Mr. Sandstrom working so hard to stay relevant in Utah politics, it's probably a safe bet that we'll be seeing both of them run for office once again very soon. Until next week, this is Marianne Martindale from the Alliance for a Better Utah with this week's edition of The Better Utah Beat. Have a great week, and remember that together we can make a better Utah. For more info, please visit betterutah.org.